Hello and welcome. I'm Frank Lavallo and this is Novel Conversations. This week, I'm going to have a conversation about the novel A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole. And I'll be joined in conversation by our Novel Conversations readers, Scott Rich and Patrick Andrews. Scott, Patrick, welcome. Thanks so much. Well, Frank. Scott, Patrick, as you know, I usually like to write and read a brief introduction to our novel before we start our conversation. But our novel today has an introduction by the well-known author Walker Percy. He gives an introduction about our novel and its main character, Ignatius J. Riley, that I think I'd like to read instead of trying to compete with his introduction. Here is Ignatius Riley, without progenitor in any literature I know of, slob extraordinary, a mad Oliver Hardy, a fat Don Quixote, a perverse Thomas Aquinas rolled into one, who is in violent revolt against the entire modern age, lying in his flannel nightshirt in a back bedroom on Constantinople Street in New Orleans, who, between gigantic seizures of flatulence and eructations, is filling dozens of big chief tablets with invective. His mother thinks he needs to go to work, and so he does, in a succession of jobs. Each job rapidly escalates into a lunatic adventure, a full-blown disaster, yet each has, like Don Quixote's, its own eerie logic. Scott, let me start with you. Was this the first time you read Confederacy of Dunces? This is my second read through this novel, twice in the last year or so. Do you remember how you reacted to it the first time you read it? The first time was a combination of shock, horror, and overwhelmingly impressed by the quality of writing. And the second time through, I was almost blown away by the quality of writing. Everything that I knew was coming, I realized the second time through, was foreshadowed incredibly well put together. It's not quite linear in its narrative. He introduces us to a lot of characters right away, practically in the very first scene. And then some of those characters leave the stage for a while, only to come back to be involved in our story later. But very logically and very realistically, not forced into the novel at all. Patrick, let me ask you, first time reading Confederacy of Dunces? No, this is actually the third time. A good friend recommended the book to me probably 10, 12 years ago. I read it for the second time maybe two or three years ago, and then again just recently. Walker Percy talks about reading it at least three or four times himself, and he says every time he reads it, he laughs out loud. I know I had that reaction. How about you, Patrick? Oh, absolutely. This is a book that you can really read three, four, five, six times, I think. Enjoy it every time and maybe see a little something you didn't see in a previous run. My wife, who has not read this yet, is getting tired of me demanding that I read things out loud to her because it's so funny. Well, I can sort of understand that reaction. My wife demanded that I keep reading to her parts because she'd hear me laughing, and she'd want to know what I was laughing about. And my wife has read the book, and as we would sit in the same room reading, and she heard me laughing about it, she'd say to me, I can tell by the way you're laughing what you're laughing at. (laughs) And we're still laughing. All right, Scott, in our introduction, I said that we are introduced to almost all of our characters in the very first scene. Well, Ignatius is standing outside a grocery store. He has his loot strings sticking out of his bag. They're basically like guitar strings, and he's waiting for his mother to come back from the bakery. But it already tells us something about Ignatius Riley, that he plays a lute and not a guitar or some other stringed instrument. Tell me about his appearance. Well, I think we should probably let the author tell us about it. Here is John Kennedy Toole's description of Ignatius J. Riley. A green hunting cap squeezed the top of the fleshy balloon of a head. The green ear flaps full of large ears and uncut hair and the fine bristles that grew in the ears themselves stuck out on either side like turn signals, indicating two directions at once. Full pursed lips protruded beneath the bushy black mustache and, at their corners, sank into the little folds filled with disapproval and potato chip crumbs. In the shadows under the green visor of the cap, Ignatius J. Riley's supercilious blue and yellow <laughs> eyes looked down, studying the crowd of people for signs of bad taste in dress. Like this guy would know bad taste in dress <laughs> if he saw it. And I suppose we can add that Ignatius is pushing about 325, at least. At least into the threes. Now, we're not told where Ignatius lives just yet, Well, New Orleans does not come to mind. Not at all. The hot, sweaty Crescent City. So you can imagine why Ignatius may draw some stares and unwanted attention. Let's continue describing him just the way the author did. Shifting from one hip to the other in his lumbering, elephantine fashion, Ignatius sent waves of flesh rippling beneath the tweed and flannel. Waves that broke upon buttons and seams. Yes, just having such a horrible appearance, he catches the attention of a local police officer who's just patrolling and says, do you have any identification? You look like a weirdo, basically. What are you doing here? And that gets Ignatius going. He doesn't like to be questioned. How dare you question me? I'm above everyone. And then the loot strings happens to smack the officer in the face a couple of times. And then an uh, older gentleman, who we will soon find out, is named Claude, speaks up and says he's just a good boy waiting for his mother. 
and uh, a couple more lute strings smack people in the face, and a couple more people join in the crowd staring at what's going on, and Mancuso gets nervous. Riley starts shouting, getting nervous. Now, wait, who's Mancuso? Mancuso is the undercover cop who's questioning him. This altercation, as you said, attracts bystanders, but finally it also attracts Ignatius's mom, who's inside the store buying some bakery. Right, so she comes out into this little scene that's been created with, of course, Ignatius at the center, and they conveniently manage to sort of shift the policeman's attention to the old man who had actually come to Ignatius' defense. He is shouting that you must be a communist for harassing innocent good boys waiting for their mothers. That's right. That's right. Our Claude Robichaux sort of gets himself involved into this situation. Right. right. This little diversion allows them to sort of scoot down the street, and they're still not sure whether they're going to be followed by this policeman or not. So they make it into the French Quarter, and Ignatius is complaining that he can't go on, that he's exhausted, and his mother suggests that they duck their heads into the Night of Joy, a somewhat seedy bar in the French Quarter. And who do we meet in the Night of Joy bar? We quickly meet Darlene. Her job is to sit at the bar and entice people to keep drinking. Very watered-down alcohol. That's right. right. And she's only paid on a commission. Right. right, she's, as they call her in the book, a bee girl. And also we meet the owner of the bar, Lana Lee, who's quite the entrepreneur. Scott, tell me about Lana Lee. Well, Lana Lee considers this bar to be her investment, and she's very protective of her investment, as she repeatedly says, and characters such as Ignatius and his mother, she feels, will ruin her good investment. And so now while Ignatius and his mom are in this bar cooling their heels... We're shifted over to another scene at the police station where Angelo Mancuso has brought in the old man, Claude Robichaux. Angelo Mancuso is a somewhat hapless police officer in New Orleans. Of course, it's his job to go out and round up characters, as they say. Under suspicion. Right. So, of course, there he is in the French Quarter. And what does he come back to the precinct house with? But some old grandpa, as he's described as. Yeah, this doesn't sit very well with his sergeant. No, and of course, the old man, Mr. Robichaud, is embarrassed by this arrest. But he's not backing down. He continues on with the invective that we heard from Riley. There's all kinds of criminals out there, and you're bothering me. What am I grandkids going to think? Right. So he's not too bright, actually, I guess you'd say about Claude. (laughs) But this sort of works to his advantage. At some point, the sergeant gets fed up with him and tells Mancuso, get him out of here. Right. Of course, meanwhile, we meet yet another character who's detained in the station house. Kind of waiting his turn to be lectured to by the police. Scott, tell me a little bit about Jones. Well, Jones is a black man, and he is in the police station right now because someone apparently stole a bag of cashews at the Woolworth store. And as the black man in the Woolworths, someone took it. It must have been me that took it. No evidence, so they're just going to lecture him and let him go. But he is threatened here that if he does not come up with a job, then he would be thrown in jail for vagrancy. And then again, our novel moves back to Ignatius and his mom. Now, they've been hanging out in this bar for a while. In fact, I think Mrs. Riley has broken out the cakes that she bought at the bakery, and she's serving all the patrons in the bar her little white cakes while drinking their beers. Right. She's drinking beers. Ignatius is drinking Dr. Nutt. And they're not getting the message from the bartender who will not come over to serve them and says we've run out of clean glasses. Yeah, Lana Lee, as you said, wants them out of here. These kind of characters are going to impede her other traffic. Right. Of course, there does come a time when Ignatius and his mom do leave the bar. Yes, but not before Mrs. Riley has been engaged in conversation with a young man described as elegantly dressed who chain-smoked Salem's and drank frozen daiquiris in gulps. Well, this is Dorian Green. And Dorian's discovered that this isn't his type of bar, but he has taken a liking to Mrs. Riley's hat. So he buys it from her for $15. And that money comes in handy because they actually had no money for their drinks. That's right. But Scott, their departure from the Night of Joy bar is not a very smooth one. No, not in the least. Mom has had a bit too much, and she ends up backing the car into somebody's back porch. Then she tries to pull away, pulling the porch off the house, and backs into another car while she's at it. And who should come around the corner and see this accident just as they're driving away? Officer Mancuso. And he does recognize these people Uh, this time. Here's one of the odd things about Mancuso. His job has been threatened. If you can't bring in some serious characters, you're not going to be around here very long. And now he has a chance to really arrest somebody who's driving drunk, looks absurd. And what does he do? He lets them off the hook, talks to the owner of the house, 
works out a way for her to pay him back over time. But let's get back to Ignatius and Irene Riley. It's in the car on the way home that we learn about some of Ignatius J. Riley's interesting qualities. Yeah. Essentially, with every bump of the car, he declares that a valve inside of his system will spontaneously shut tighter than a drum, and he'll be sick and injured for weeks to come. Everything that happens to Ignatius J. Riley affects this valve. He has a very acute sense of his valve's functioning. Right. Whenever he's nervous or upset or stressed or feels like he may be stressed, his valve starts to act up. As far as he's concerned, his valve starts to act up. That's right. And Patrick, this all occurs while he's in the back seat of the car. Right. Of course, he would never ride in the front seat of any death trap like the 46 Plymouth his mother drives. Didn't he once read an article that said that the front passenger's seat was the most dangerous seat in a car? Right. He read some statistics somewhere that made it out as one of the most dangerous places to be in a car accident. So, of course, he will not ride up there. All right. Right, let's get Ignatius and Irene Riley back home. And it's at this time, when we move into our second chapter, that we get an expanded view of Ignatius and some of his experiences. Yeah, he writes so elegantly. It turns out he has a master's degree in history. He, he seems to have majored in medieval studies. They talk about him being in college for eight years. Right. Hanging out. But he did receive the MA degree, and at some point he was also giving lectures to students as well. Probably like a teacher's assistant or graduate assistant, something like that. And he leads us to understand that he'll write two or three paragraphs in a big chief notebook, and then he throws a notebook on the floor or under his bed, and he'll start writing something else in a new notebook. Let me read you a little sample of this. With the breakdown of the medieval system, the gods of chaos, lunacy, and bad taste gained ascendancy. And it says, This had been a very productive morning, he thought. He had not accomplished so much in weeks. Two full paragraphs. Right, so at one point when his mother comes in his room, she says, Ignatius, what's all this trash on the floor? That is my worldview that you see, so be careful where you step. Right, they're everywhere. It says, In the five years that he had dedicated to this work, writing these manuscripts, he had produced an average of only six paragraphs monthly. He could not even remember what he had written in some of the tablets. But Scott, he has a grand scheme for these writings and musings. That's right. Also in the same paragraph, Toole writes, But one day he would assume the task of editing these fragments of his mentality into a grand design. The completed puzzle would show literate men the disaster course that history had been taking for the past four centuries. But now, because of this car accident and the fact that they're going to have to help someone repair their house... His mother decides, it's time for you to go get a job. That's right. This is a shock to Ignatius' system. Oh. Though. I can hear his pyoric valve shutting from here. As Walker Percy said, one lunatic adventure after another is about to begin. And boy, do we have some lunatic adventures coming up. That's right. Ignatius J. Riley has to get a job. And he goes looking. He gets depressed easily, and he finds that when he gets depressed, the best thing to do is to go and watch a movie. And then go home. So he goes on an interview, gets depressed, goes to a movie. He doesn't always seem to make it to the interview. If something goes wrong, he stubs his toe, then he's just not in the mood to look for work. Or he makes it to the interview, and as he relates to his mother, he ends up explaining the inadequacies of the place to the personnel manager, who in the end becomes rather hostile towards him. <laughs> right. Every interview he goes on, either the office is too cold or too hot, the lights are too bright or too dark, there's always going to be a reason why he can't take this job. But Scott, eventually he does land the job. That's right. He answers an ad for Levy Pants. Levy Pants. The atmosphere of Levy Pants reminded Ignatius of his own room, and his valve agreed by opening joyfully. Ignatius prayed almost audibly that he would be accepted for the job. He was impressed and overwhelmed. Right, and of course, a more objective description of that office precedes that paragraph where it says Ignatius found himself in perhaps the most disreputable office that he had ever entered. We also meet two workers here at Levy Pants. That's right, we meet Miss Trixie, who is old, apparently senile. Just waiting to retire. And or bite people. <laughs> That's right. Right, and we meet Mr. Gonzalez, the office manager, who is as improbably impressed with Ignatius as Ignatius is with the office. And so Ignatius does, in fact, get this job. What's his job going to be? filing clerk. He can alphabetize. <laughs> With a master's degree, I should hope so. And at $60 a week. Well, Scott, Ignatius Riley is not our only character that needs to get a job. The novel now moves back to Jones. That's right. Turns out he is interviewing at the Knight of Joy Bar for a porter position. Exactly. Lana Lee, the owner of the Knight of Joy Bar, knows that she can take advantage of Jones because his options are take this job or go to jail. 
And she does take advantage of him. Yeah, and you really kind of pick up on a strong theme of the book, the civil rights issues at the time, and Louisiana in particular. And Jones makes sure that we do. Yes, he makes a great issue over and over again throughout the book that he's only going to receive $20 per week for the work that he's going to do. And that is nowhere near the minimum wage, or minimal wage, as he likes to say. Right, and Jones pretty quickly realizes there's more being served out of the Night of Joy bar than just some watered-down drinks. There's one young high school-age boy, George, who comes around the bar and exchanges money for these brown paper packages with the owner of the bar, Lana Lee. But we don't know what's in these packages, right? We don't, and when Jones asks about it, Lana claims that it's some charity work. Going to the orphans. Yeah, some school supplies going to the orphans. But Lana also uses this as a threat. She tells Jones, keep your mouth shut keep your eyes closed, or all I got to do is call the police and they'll just pick you up for vagrancy. Yeah, and the more she threatens him with this, the more he builds up resentment for only receiving $20 a week, and the more he wants to know what's in those packages to get her into some serious trouble. But you know what? I think we're going to leave Lana Lee and George and these brown-wrapped packages and get back to Ignatius, because I really want to hear how this job at Levy Pants is working out. Things are going great for everyone involved. Ignatius loves it because they don't mind when he comes into work a little late. He's making the office more like home. Putting up posters and pictures. And he's even sprouting beans. Right, and Mr. Gonzalez loves the fact that the filing, which had been piling up, has all disappeared. Ignatius seems to be an excellent clerk. Absolute whiz kid at this. But Scott, where are those files going? The circular file. Ah. That's known as the trash. He's throwing things away instead of filing. He doesn't want to be disturbed. It upsets his valve if he has to sit there and alphabetize things. It's at this time that we're introduced to a new character. He gets a letter from an old girlfriend. Tell me a little bit about Myrna Minkoff. Myrna Minkoff is a good friend of Ignatius Riley. They met in college. She's from New York. A Jewish background, came for money, but resents it at the same time. And Myrna is dedicating her life to freeing humanity. And her worldview is rather Freudian. She thinks that the people in the world are repressed. And Ignatius in particular. Especially Ignatius. But how does a letter from Myrna now shake up Ignatius and his situation at work? Ignatius is in a little competition with Myrna. She's, of course, a fellow intellectual. And she sees herself doing good and beginning political movements and social movements to help society. Right. She's a cause person, a proto-hippie. Well, when reading the letter, Ignatius decides, oh, I can do that. I'm just as smart as she is. I'm going to find a cause. Right. And I'm going to create some political change of my own. And of course, where does he turn but Levy Pants? That's right. There is an entire factory of underpaid black workers. So what's his plan? Well, it's going to be sort of a combination of a civil rights workers' strike by the factory workers at Levy Pants against the management, which really consists only of Mr. Gonzalez, the office manager. He never really publicly declares what he wants to achieve, just that he's crusading for their dignity. And I think they interpret that as... He's going to get us more money and better conditions. And he has a vision of black people marching in under his leadership and physically assaulting Mr. Gonzalez. But let's be clear. The workers at Levy Pants weren't agitated. They were not angry. They weren't already forming unions and storming the office. They seemed pretty content. There wasn't apparently a lot of work to do at Levy Pants. So they did their own work pretty much on company time. Yeah, they did a lot of radio playing, a lot of dancing even. So yeah, they're somewhat impressed with Ignatius because he's an educated man and he sounds smart. And here he is apparently taking an interest in their plight. But once he starts putting these plans into real action, they're not so sure. He tells them to bring weapons to work, that they're going to storm the office. He creates banners for them to fly. With his bedsheets. With his disgusting, unwashed bedsheets. Right. So the workers are sort of going along for a little bit, but of course, they're not actually going to assault anyone. And so this grand scheme essentially comes to nothing. Except for the loss of Ignatius's job. But he leaves with a parting shot. Right. Earlier, Ignatius had taken the liberty of responding to some correspondence that Mr. Gonzalez had left on his own desk with one of Levy Pants' customers, who was complaining about some of the shoddy work that they had received. I think the salutation will give you an idea. He responds, Mr. Abelman, Mongoloid Esquire. (laughs) He essentially assails the customer for complaining about the quality of the work that Levy Pants is sending him. Right, and of course he signs the letter Gus Levy, who is the absent owner of the company. But he's not going to remain absent for long. We very soon come to meet Gus Levy and his wife. 
Right. In fact, Gus happens to be in the office the day Ignatius has this riot, and he fires him. Very justly, I might add. But Scott, even though Ignatius's mom, Irene Riley, has become a bit preoccupied with a couple other people in her life right now, she demands that Ignatius go right back out and find another job. And essentially, that's what he does. It takes a little bit of time. Right. While he's walking down the street one day, out of money to go to the movies, his usual pastime. You've got questions. We've got answers. Business leadership, ownership, and sales can be challenging. Tune into the Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast to learn from the world's experts. Join me, your host, Diane Helbig, as I chat with people who have expertise in various areas of business. You'll enjoy the lively conversations that are focused on providing you with the ideas, tips, and suggestions you need to realize greater success. Get what you need for your business when you need it from the people who have the answers. Accelerate Your Business Growth is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. He's drawn by a pungent odor to an open garage door, which houses Paradise Vendors, an outfit that sells hot dogs from these large hot dog-shaped carts. That's right. The quote is, He sniffed the fumes from paradise with great sensory pleasure, the protruding hairs in his nostrils analyzing, cataloging, categorizing, and classifying the distinct odors of hot dog, mustard, and lubricant. Right, and of course, when Ignatius asks what they're made of, the man says, rubber, cereal, tripe, who knows? I wouldn't touch one myself. They're curiously appealing, Ignatius says. My favorite line in the sequence is when Ignatius asks if he can pick out his own hot dog, and the man tells him, don't touch the water. Look what it done to the fork. <laughs> and the fork is corroding, has lost one of its tines. But that doesn't turn Ignatius off. And as soon as he finishes, he says, I believe I'll have another one of your dainties. And I believe he has four. In this sitting. Right. Well, Ignatius has not gone in here looking for a job. He's gone in there hungry. And before he knows it, he's eaten a couple dollars worth of hot dogs. And of course, he has no money. He has 10 cents. So the owner of Paradise Vendors sort of strong arms Ignatius into becoming a vendor for him because he's been eating his hot dogs already. That's right. He puts the corroded fork to his muffler and throat. (laughs) That's right. Ignatius finally vaguely agrees to possibly return the next day and sell hot dogs for him. But he realizes that this is one way to keep his mother off his back. He'll have gotten a job. And there'll be little management while he's on duty. But you guys haven't mentioned the best part. Free hot dogs. All the hot dogs you can eat. Eventually, he tells his boss, hey, I'm your best customer. (laughs) Right. And he's going to gain a considerable additional amount of weight. Even he notices how much extra weight he's beginning to put on. But let's be clear, his mother, while she wanted him to find a job, is not very happy that he's got this job. The shame it's brought upon the family and the entire block, Constantinople Street. That her boy's selling weenies and eventually doing so in a pirate costume to attract customers. But he sort of enjoys this job. Absolutely. But he oftentimes seems to be the only customer. So he's essentially eating his profits and coming home with a quarter, a dollar. And sometimes in debt to the owner. (laughs) He's not particularly interested in selling hot dogs, and the few customers that try to buy hot dogs from him, he refuses to sell them to them. They do not appear qualified to consume his fine product. So essentially, this continues the money crunch that Ignatius is under. Luckily for him, he runs into a character we've already met who might help him relieve this money crunch. That's right. He runs into George, the young man who is buying packages from Lana Lee at the Night of Joy Bar, and George is looking to hide these brown paper packages during the day. Right, so he sees Ignatius and this hot dog wagon, and he thinks, this will be perfect. I'll pay this patsy a couple bucks to hide these packages for a couple hours in his bun drawer, and then I'll come by and get them at the end of the afternoon. And it does work out well for Ignatius. He's now getting $10 a day. And, of course, Ignatius immediately opens these packages, discovers what they are, and then threatens the kid with turning him in if he doesn't pay him more money. Well, Patrick, what is in these packages? Well, they're risque photos of Lana Lee, which George is selling to his high school friends. Ignatius is intrigued by these postcards, and he actually takes one from the package, but also notices an address written on the packaging, and he surreptitiously removes that address as well. Now, Scott, we know how that address got on the package. That's right. Some time ago, Jones, sweeping at the Night of Joy Bar, saw these packages and wrote the address thinking that eventually, maybe, this will come back and haunt Lana Lee. That's right. Jones is still carrying a lot of resentment for being paid this low, minimal wage, as he says, and he's trying to figure out a way to sabotage the Night of Joy Bar. And this is one of the ways he comes up with. But right now, Ignatius doesn't know where this address is. Right. 
but he has a job that he's pretty happy with. But I'm guessing that's not going to last for long. Something has to go wrong with Ignatius if he's working. Right. Ignatius has a chance encounter on the job with the rather flamboyant character from the French Quarter. And this flamboyant character is the same Dorian Green that we had met earlier at the Night of Joy Bar. In fact, it's the guy who bought Irene Riley's hat. Right. So after running into Dorian, Ignatius comes up with the idea for his new cause. Which becomes known as the Save the World Through Degeneracy cause. How's that going to work for him? Well, Ignatius wants to gather together some of the degenerates, some of the oddballs, misfits of the French Quarter, He wants to gather them together into a political movement, which he hopes will sweep the country and the world in the cause of world peace. This is sort of an offshoot of the whole Myrna Minkoff plan that she had, isn't it? Exactly. He's in competition, and they're in constant communication with each other, trading letters and telegrams. And insults. And insults. He hopes that this will show her that he's engaged in the world. Right, and her worldview is be less repressive. Now his worldview is be more degenerate. Exactly. So he decides to organize a rally. And meanwhile, Mr. Levy, Gus Levy, Levy Pants, is searching for Ignatius. But Levy already fired him. Why is he searching for Ignatius? Because of that letter titled Mr. I. Abelman, Mongoloid Esquire. Oh, that's right. The letter that Ignatius wrote to one of their best customers. That's right. Mr. Abelman took umbrage with that letter and is now suing Mr. Levy for $500,000. And all fingers point to Ignatius J. Riley, don't they? And rightly and justly so. But let's get back to this rally. You got to tell me, how's this rally going to work out? This rally goes horribly awry. No surprise there. None at all. Ignatius is trying to give a great speech telling them his political vision, how they can overthrow world governments and create peace throughout the world. Peace through degeneracy. Correct. No one wants to listen. They are more interested in dancing. And so to get back to dancing, they ask the short-haired women to chase Ignatius out of the building. The Women's Auxiliary Brigade. That's what they are called by Ignatius, yes. And so the Women's Auxiliary Brigade tell him he has 10 minutes to get a head start before they come after him. And he takes them seriously. He runs. And this is a guy that doesn't run very well. First he checks his Mickey Mouse watch for the time. That's right. But he's got a place to run to. Let's not forget. He's got a very interesting picture in his pocket, as well as an address of where he might find more like this. Yeah, he's convinced a woman in this picture... An intellectual soulmate of his. That's right. Turns out she's holding a book by his favorite author, Boethius. And what happens when he gets to this address? Well, of course, it turns out to be the Night of Joy bar where all of his troubles started. That's right. And Jones is recruiting people to enter the bar. And why is Jones outside the bar enticing people to come inside? Well, coincidentally, it turns out that Darlene, the former B-girl at the Night of Joy, is debuting a new stage act. In a seedy bar in New Orleans. Yes. And when Jones sees Ignatius, he realizes this is the perfect man to let into the bar. Doubtlessly, he will sabotage this act somehow, and this will be the perfect revenge for Lana Lee's minimal wage. But let's be clear, Ignatius wanted to go into the bar because he wants to see this mystery girl who's on this photograph that he's got. Right. Ignatius believes that this is a fellow intellectual soulmate who's been reduced to working in one of these bars just like he's been reduced to selling hot dogs. Perhaps even against her will, and he can save her. Exactly, that's right. All right, guys, and let me guess. It goes horribly wrong. Horribly wrong. Comically wrong. The valve, the valve. Yes, in fact, the valve cements shut at this moment. And of course, the parrot in Darlene's act attacks Ignatius. And this all sends Ignatius reeling through the bar, knocking over (laughs) all the tables on the way, spilling out the front door into the street. Right, he hurdles into the street. With the bird still attacking, the waitress (laughs) demanding $24, and Darlene going after her bird. And Lana Lee yelling for Jones, get him out of here, get him out of here. Just as a bus is coming down the street. The desire bus. So as Ignatius reels out of the bar, Jones actually saves his life. At the last moment, grabbing him by his white paradise vendor's hot dog smock, (laughs) preventing him from being run over by... A bus named Desire. Yes. (laughs) At this point, Ignatius faints. But the surprises continue. That's right. Out of the shadows steps Mancuso. Mancuso, the police officer? That's right. And right behind him are the Women's Auxiliary Brigade. And they proceed to wail on Mancuso and Ignatius. Right. So with the help of Jones, 
Mancuso ends up arresting the Women's Auxiliary Brigade and Lana Lee for trafficking in risque photos. And this is a big bust for Mancuso. Exactly. This is just what he needed. Not so good for Lana Lee. How did things turn out for Ignatius? Well, things are getting worse for Ignatius. The next morning, when he returns from the hospital, Gus Levy is waiting for him on his front porch. Oh, yeah, right. The lawsuit from Abelman. Exactly. And also, this episode the previous night has made it into the newspapers, and this is the final straw for Mrs. Riley, Ignatius's mother. She goes on to call him not just crazy, but mean. But even worse for Ignatius, she's going to call Charity Hospital. The psychiatric hospital. She's really had it. Right. The embarrassment to herself, the family, and Constantinople Street is just too much. And she's convinced that he is crazy. Well, Scott, how does Ignatius deal with Gus Levy? He quickly denies everything. Of course. And he goes on to blame that senile co-worker that he once had. That was Trixie, Trixie, the accountant, right? Correct. And Miss Trixie, in her senile state, is happy to confess to anything if they'll just retire her, which he's happy to do. So at least Levy solves his problem. Right. And since she's a crazy old woman, he'll be off the hook for the lawsuit. And so will she. And really, she is a crazy old woman who needs to be retired. Yeah, but let's get back to our crazy young man, Ignatius. Is he going to the hospital? Well, his worldview is looking rather bleak at this moment. He very quickly deduces from a few hints his mother gives him that she must be planning something. And he figures either she's going to send me away for being crazy or I'm going to end up in jail because of this Levy thing. And he thinks, well, jail is better than having your worldview taken away from you by a bunch of psychologists. And in a panic, not knowing what to do, there are three knocks at the door. And, of course, Ignatius doesn't know whether this is Gus Levy coming back to confront him with the police, whether it's the men from the psychiatric hospital coming to haul him away in a straitjacket. Or Mancuso there to arrest him. Right. It turns out to be... Mirna Minkoff. Now, that I did not see coming. Terribly disturbed by his last message. Mirna has driven nonstop from New York to New Orleans in an effort to save Ignatius, feeling that he has finally reached his breaking point. This gathered through their correspondence. And since all of her other social endeavors have completely failed, she might as well save Ignatius. Right at the nick of time. And he's quick to leave right now, but she says, what about your things? And so they pack. What do they pack? He manages to pack his socks. A yo-yo. And most of his big chief tablets containing his worldview. In fragments. Right. Waiting to be ordered. And they make their escape. In the nick of time as the psychiatric hospital has their ambulance coming down the street. And of course, Myrna thinks now that she has really saved Ignatius. But what is Ignatius thinking? You know, he's happy not to be going to the nut house. So he's off to New York. And the most bizarre thing, even Ignatius seems to be happy finally. As if the air were a purgative, his valve opened. He breathed again, <sighs> this time more deeply. The dull headache was lifting. He stared gravely at the back of Myrna's head. How ironic, Ignatius thought. And that's how our novel, A Confederacy of Dunces, ends. Improbable, as it seems, everyone but Lana has a happy ending. That's right. Now, of course, Scott, Patrick, in a novel of this size with so many characters, so many great characters, we can't get to every moment. We can't get to every quote. We actually didn't even get to every character. So now's your opportunity. You know, it's almost painful how many hilarious scenes you just don't have time to share with you. A lot of profound ones as well. But you've chosen to share a funny one. That's right, I have. This is a line when Ignatius is discussing his political vision with his favorite degenerate. He asks him if he reads, and the man says, no, I really don't read anything at all. And Ignatius responds, then you must begin a reading program immediately so that you may understand the crisis of our age. Begin with the late Romans, including Boethius, of course. Then you should dip rather extensively into early medieval. You may skip the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. That is mostly dangerous propaganda. Now that I think of it, you had better skip the Romantics and the Victorians, too. For the contemporary period, you should study some selected comic books. I recommend Batman, especially. For he tends to transcend the abysmal society in which he's found himself. His morality is rather rigid, also. I rather respect Batman. <laughs> well, along those lines, we've talked a lot about Ignatius's worldview, but not specifically. But in this one passage, his mother's trying to get at again why it is Ignatius has not made good in spite of his education and why it was he had been thrown out of the one teaching job that he had. And Ignatius says, oh, it was basically the same. Some poor white from Mississippi told the dean that I was a propagandist for the pope, which is patently untrue. I do not support the current pope. He does not at all fit my concept of a good authoritarian pope. Actually, I'm opposed to the relativism of modern Catholicism quite violently. And actually, Patrick, I'm glad you mentioned Ignatius Riley and his worldview, because I found a quote that I think sums up his worldview. And this is a quote picked by John Kennedy Toole to explain Ignatius J. Riley's worldview. 
It's a quote from Jonathan Swift. When a true genius appears in the world, you may know him by this sign, that the dunces are all in confederacy against him. And the dunces certainly united against Ignatius in this novel. Well, at least in his worldview. Patrick, I know you have one more quote you want to read before we end our conversation. Yes, this is the morning following the car accident at the start of the book. Ignatius wakes up in bed. Ignatius pulled his flannel nightshirt up and looked at his bloated stomach. He often bloated while lying in bed in the morning and contemplating the unfortunate turn that events had taken since the Reformation. Doris Day and Greyhound scenic cruisers, whenever they came to mind, created an even more rapid expansion of his central region. <laughs> <I'm not> done. <laughs> <laughs> but since the attempted arrest in the accident, he had been bloating for almost no reason at all, his pyloric valve snapping shut indiscriminately and filling his stomach <laughs> with trapped gas, gas which had character and being and resented its confinement. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? I think it's on that quote that we're going to end this confederacy. I mean, end <laughs> this conversation today on the novel, A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole. Patrick, Scott, I want to thank both of you for coming in and having this conversation with me today. It was a pleasure, Frank. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you again. Joining me now for Endnotes on today's conversation about the novel A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole is our researcher, Ted Schwartz. Ted, hello. Hello. Ted, as you heard, the readers and I found this novel to be amazing and hysterically funny. But the story of John Kennedy Toole, its author, while amazing, is not very funny. No, it's kind of a sad history. This book was written in 1961. He's trying to sell the book, he has no idea how to do this, but he had the other problem of he was gradually becoming a schizophrenic. He's fighting with his mother. His mother had always been his strongest advocate and worst enemy. On January 20th, 1969, he's had enough and leaves New Orleans forever. Well, those kind of feelings don't really surprise me coming from a guy who created Ignatius J. Riley. Yes. Now, when he left, he stopped by the home of Flannery O'Connor in Midgeville, Georgia, and then was returning to New Orleans. Now, we don't know why on any of this. And why don't we know why? Because on March 26th, on an isolated road just outside Biloxi, Mississippi, he took his car, started running it, ran a hose from the exhaust into the inside of the car passenger section, sat down and died. Well, Ted, that's the sad part of John Kennedy Toole's life. I want to get to the amazing part. Tell me about Walker Percy's involvement in getting a confederacy of dunces to the public. Toole's mother, Thelma Toole, became obsessed with getting her son's book published, knew less than he did about selling it, so ends up over at the local university, and Walker Percy was desperate to not read it. Actually, do you have his quote? Yes. Walker Percy later wrote as a forward to a confederacy of dunces, Over the years, I have become very good at getting out of things I didn't want to do, and if ever there was something I didn't want to do, this was surely it. To deal with the mother of a dead novelist? But the lady was persistent. Only one hope remained, that I could read a few pages and that they would be bad enough for me, in good conscience, to read no further. Usually I can do just that. Indeed, the first paragraph often suffices. My only fear was that this one might not be bad enough or might be just good enough, so I would have to keep reading. And he then relates how excited he was because it was really good. And in fact, Walker Percy helped to get this book published. He took it to the local university press, which normally does not do this kind of book at all, can't sell this kind of book. They got lucky. They actually began to sell this thing. It was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. It won the Pulitzer Prize. And along the way, it sold 1.8 million copies, a sale that I'm sure no university press has matched before or since. Clearly, there's genius in this novel. Very much so. Ted, thank you again for bringing in notes to today's conversation about the novel A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole. You're welcome. I also want to thank our Novel Conversations readers, Scott Rich and Patrick Andrews. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Today I had a conversation about the novel A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole. Until next week, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. You've got questions, we've got answers. Business leadership, ownership, and sales can be challenging. Tune into the Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast to learn from the world's experts. Join me, your host, Diane Helbig, as I chat with people who have expertise in various areas of business. You'll enjoy the lively conversations that are focused on providing you with the ideas, tips, and suggestions you need to realize greater success. Get what you need for your business when you need it from the people who have the answers. 
Accelerate Your Business Growth is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.